This is Sparta! What's going on, Magic Fam? It's your boy Blue here. You're this week's uh, little big episode is going to be a Blue's Budget Bruise. It is my Commander Budget Deck Tech. Uh, it was supposed to be Shatter Gang Brothers this week. I had mentioned that I was going to be doing some decks after the convention if I didn't get to them beforehand, which I didn't. There are four decks I didn't get to. Uh, Shatter Gang Brothers was one of them. Unfortunately, that did sell while I was at the con, so I can't do that video. But I got the other three to go. So we're going to do this week's video. It's Quende, Pride Ephemera. It is a Mono White Commander. I understand that Mono White isn't as powerful as some of the other colors, specifically green, black, or blue. I get that, but it still can be fun. It still can actually have a theme that works very well and actually can win some games. I want to mention to excuse my voice, uh, the con thrashed my voice badly. Uh, I had lost it. I'm just now getting it back, so I want to get this video done for the week so that I can get my weekly video out there. So let's talk about Quende. So it is Mono White, as I said. It's a Human Knight, 2-2 two, two for 4. It has Double Strike, which is always fun in combat. And it gives creatures that you control with First Strike, Double Strike, Okay. You can kind of see the theme of this one. This one's going to definitely be an aggro deck. It's going to be like White Weenie on steroids. And just about every creature in here is going to obviously have First Strike. So you're going to win with combat and combat tricks. And hopefully, if done right, you can possibly even do it through commander damage. So let me get into the deck, show you what it actually has in it for this build. And then we'll get into some upgrades. And I'll talk to you about something coming up. So let's get started. <coughs> All right. So let me zoom out a little bit so that you guys can see everything. All right. So... We start with the lands like I always do. Um, it's mono white, so as much mono white good stuff that I could find. So we go with cycling lands for the white, so secluded step, drifting meadows, and desert of the true, because obviously, you know, bad draws later, if you can get rid of land draws when you don't need it, because this, like, I believe the highest converted mana cost in this deck might be six, but there's only one of them. So most of the stuff in here is two or three. Uh, sandstone bridge, always good to have the ability to buff your creatures and give them vigilance, especially when they have double strike. Uh, Idealic Grange, again, giving them a buff just by playing a land is always good with Double Strike. Rogue's Passage, I, I mentioned that we're going to try, if we can, to get a commander damage win out of it. Rogue's Passage will help guide you there. Field of Ruin, because uh, if, if you've watched any of my other videos, you'll notice that I always include some kind of non-basic land destruction in every deck, because there's always that one land you just have to kill. And then it's really just a lot of planes after that. It's not really all that special, uh, because... Any special white land that can do anything good is expensive. And I'm talking like $100 expensive, so... Uh, we're gonna go into some ramp real quick. On the ramp, it's not really all that special. White has ramp. Let's just get that straight. It has not as good as green, but has better than every other color. The problem is, is that because it's the secondary color and it's very limited, it's expensive monetarily, so we have to go with what we can on a budget. So Renegade Map is something that goes against the land, Travels Amulet, and this isn't really ramp so much as it's not mana fixing because you don't need to fix mana, but it helps thin out your deck of bad draws later and get you land in your hand if you need to play a land. Magnifying Glass, so it's a 30 cast mana rock that helps you investigate, and investigate basically puts a clue into play, and you can sacrifice that clue, which is a treasure token, to draw a card. So, <laughs> fixing two things that white is weak in. It gives you a little bit of ramp, uh, but it also helps you draw cards. And it does it without sacrificing it, so it's repeated ability to draw a card. Uh, Sears Lantern, kind of a lesser version of the Magnifying Glass. So, it's a 3 cast mana rock, but it lets you scry one, so you can scry bad draws away and get good ones. Bonders Ornaments, a new one that I'm uh, trying to start integrating into the decks as long as I get more copies of it. I only have a couple. Uh, this one lets you, it's a mana rock that for three, it lets you add a mana of any color. Obviously, you're only going to use white. And then for four, you can have each player who controls a Bonders Ornament draw a card. Most likely, it's not heavily played, so most likely it'll only be you. So another way to draw cards. And then I'm going to do a hybrid here because I'm going to get into the creatures next. Uh, this is the first ramp uh, that's also a creature. It's the only one in the deck. It's a Burnished Heart. It's a 30 cast 2 2 elk. And then you, when it's in play, you can pay three and sacrifice it. And then you can search your library for up to two basics, which are a lot of in this deck. And then put them into the battle, on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. So that's the mini ramp session that Mono White has on a budget. Uh, let's get into the creatures. All right, this is where the meat of this deck is, because as you can see, it's a pretty big section. This deck is basically very monotoned as far as its combat-based damage all around. There is no real shenanigans, there's no fireball effects or anything like that. So almost all the creatures here will have first strike and at a cheap cost. So we start with Encampment Keeper, one to catch one, one first strike, has a bonus of buffing another creature. So obviously there's a small sub-theme of buffing your creatures with other things that already fit into the deck, all right? Uh, Thunder Hole is just a generic 1-1, one, one, but it has first strike. Uh, this one's a flying first striker for one, and it's a one-two. Very pushed as far as the power of creep. Uh, Longbow Archer is a two to cast, two-two first striker that also has reach. That's what Longbow Archer can block. As though it had flying it means, it means it has reach. So now you can stop flying. That's one of the weaknesses to usually green and white is that it doesn't have a lot of ability to stop flyers unless, of course, in what you're playing angels or not. So. Uh, Sun Home Stalwart again a two two to cast two-two with first strike, but mentor help buff other creatures. Uh, Knight of Grace, so it's a 2 to cast 2-2 two, two again. It has First Strike, and then it has Hexproof from Black. And also, if an opponent, uh, as long as any player controls a Black permanent, it also gets plus 1 plus 0, so it can be a 3-2. Uh, 
We're going to actually put the card that this is in English up here for you to see, so that way you can actually read what the card does, but it has first strike, it's a 2-1. And I forget what the abilities do, so I'll leave it up there for a second for you to read. Uh, I'll superimpose the English version so you can see. It's something's console. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. It's been a while since I made the deck, I apologize. Uh, Core Blade Master, so this one actually has double strike, it's a 2 cast 1-1 double strike, but it actually gives you another ability of equipped warriors you control have double strike. There aren't a lot of warriors in here, and... It's still just because it's got double strike, but there's a hint here as to where the deck is going. So, quick creatures, warriors, you control had double strike. There are equipment coming. Uh, Sarah's disciple, a two to cast one one flying first strike, and then whenever you cast a historic spell, it gets plus one plus one on the turn. <coughs> Keep that in mind because artifacts are considered historic, and the second part of this deck is basically Voltron style with equipment. So that will actually buff him. So remember, with Quende out, it's a flying first strike, actually double strike that gets plus one plus one every time you cast an artifact, and those artifacts are buffers as well. Danatha Capuchin Paragon could have been the commander here if I wanted. It's a sneaky second commander if you want, or it's something that you can change into the commander if you want to have a different way of playing the deck. It has First Strike, Vigilance, and Lifelink. A lot of good abilities for a 3 to cast, 2-2, two, two, and are in equipped spells. You cast, cost one less to cast. Helps you go in a different direction if you want to. You can really lean heavily into another section of R's if you want. I did not do that for this build. Seed Striker is also another double striker for 3. It's a 1-1, one, one, but it also has whenever it attacks. You may tap any number of untapped creatures you control, and the Seed Striker gets plus 1, plus 1, and a turn for each creature tapped this way, and there are a lot of creatures in here. So, <laughs> the ability to make this guy get really big and hit for a lot of damage is there. Bully Knock Cohort. I was really a fan of th this era's... I can't remember the name uh, off the top of my head, the era that had the creatures like this. Uh, there were Spirits, I believe, or Fairies that also had... Were, cohorts, the Cohorts. Uh, this... I guess it's a cycle of cards. It was really interesting and fun to build around. 3 to cast 2-2 two, two First Striker, and it gets plus one, plus one as long as you control another white creature. I believe the blue one is... is uh, what is the name of it? I actually play it in my Fairies deck. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but they all do the same thing. Pegasus Charger is another flying First Striker. I tried to eliminate that downfall of not having a lot of flyers by putting as many that had First Strike in here so you don't have that weakness. It's not enough. Uh, but it's a 3 to cast 2-1 Flying First Striker. Emissary of Sunrise, another 3 to cast 2-1 First Striker, but when it enters the battlefield, it explores, so it can become either a 3-2 or put a land in your hand. Uh, here's an oldie. Uh, that's Alliance's symbol, if you don't know what that is, from way back in the day. It looks like it says 96. Uh, 3 to cast, 1-1, one, one flying for a striker. You can also pay to make it plus 2, plus 0, but you can only do it once a turn. Ghostblade Ilon. This is one of the cool abilities from Born of the Gods, so bestow ability. So it's a 3 to cast, 1-1, one, one double striker. Or you can pay it, play it for the 6, which I know is steep, but depending on how late in game you are... Uh, it could really make a difference, and it actually comes into play as an enchantment on a creature, an aura, if you will, and that creature gets plus one, plus one, and double strike, and then if that creature dies, this falls off and becomes the 1-1 one, one creature. That's how this still works. <laughs> uh, Pilgrim of the Ages was not put in here for its ability of first strike, because it doesn't have it. It's a 30 cast 2-1 that when it enters, you may search your library for planes. Obviously, that's what this is here for. Uh, reveal put in your hand, and then you can return it from your graveyard to your hand, so it's recursion to go get lands out of your deck, so you don't draw them later. Mentor the Meek, so obviously another non-first striker. 3 to cast 2-2, two, two. whenever another creature with power 2 or less enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay 1, and if you do draw a card, the importance of that is that nothing in here is going to be buffed right as soon as it hits the battlefield. It will be buffed by other things later, so you'll at least get the chance to use that ability to draw cards. <coughs> Verge Rangers, a 3 to cast 3-3 three, three, first striker. Helps you look at the top card of your library at any time, which is usually a blue ability. As long as an opponent controls more lands than you, you may play lands from the top of your library. Always good, because then you can also get lands out of the way. So, that's important. This one actually is good utility. Cloud Crusader, generic, just 4 to cast 2-3, flying for a striker. Uh, the Celestial Crusader is a 4 to cast 2-2 two, two with flash, so it can be played as an instant at any time. Uh, split second, which means that it cannot be interrupted. Nobody can do anything except for add mana to their mana pool when you cast it until it resolves. Flying, and then other white creatures get plus one, plus one. Now, I did say there aren't a lot of buffs in this, or just not even a minute ago. This is one of the very few. Uh, the point is to make sure that you can get something down that, that combat trick. That's what this is for. Uh, Akundu Griffin is just a generic 40 cast 2-2 two -two flyer for striking. Same thing with the Rager Tooth Griffin. So the Griffins in here are literally just for flying creatures, but they have first strike. Odric, Master Tactician. This is where it gets a little fun. Also can be your uh, a sneaky commander. It's a 40 cast 3-4. Great stats right off the bat. It's a soldier that has first strike. Obviously, that's the theme of the deck. And whenever uh, the Tactician and at least three other creatures attack, uh, choose which creatures block this combat and how those creatures block. <laughs> so, one of the cool things with First Strike is, is that if you do it correctly, you can basically wipe an opponent's board just from your creatures by choosing how they block when they do, okay? And with his ability, you force that, and it's really an interesting way of doing it. It's a little more advanced than most of my beginner decks how to do that because a lot of people still are figuring out combat, but it really is good. If you need any more in-depth explanation for it, you can just contact me and I'll explain a little further if you don't understand it. 
Sky Spear Cavalry. It's a 5 to cast 2 2 flying double strike. Uh, I added a couple of the double strikers in here in case your commander's not on the battlefield, just so you understand. Sir Alan, the Lion's Claw. So a 5 to cast 4 4 for a striker. Uh, whenever it attacks, creatures, other creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 is on the turn. Obviously, double strike plus buffs equals double buff. Uh, Steeple Rock. It's just a 5 to cast flying for a striker. Nothing important. Obviously, that's one of the cards when you do an upgrade, you take out. And then lastly, on the creature side is Atalpa Primal Dawn. It's the most expensive card in the deck. <laughs> it's usually a late-game bomb. So it's an 8 to cast, 4-8, flying, double-striking, vigilant, trample, indestructible. So when it hits the board, it's pretty much going to stay there, unless, of course, people are using exile effects. Remember, we're playing be like mostly beginners or intermediate people, and they don't have ways to deal with indestructible. <laughs> so at 4-8, it's got double-strike already, so it's actually hitting for 8 damage. Uh, it's also flying, so it helps defend. Vigilance, which means it can both attack and defend, and trample is just a bonus. So remember that there are certain rules with somebody double striking and trampling. Uh, so it's going to do the first four damage first, and then the next four damage after that. So if there is trample damage on the first four, that goes through, and then the other four go through. If you need more explanation on that, though, please do message me, because that one gets a little confusing for people who don't know the difference between, like, trample and first strike and how they interact. So please, if you have a problem with that, let me know. Uh, the next section is going to be the secondary idea of the deck, which is to make this a Voltron Commander. So it's going to be a pretty hefty section of various styles and types of equipment. <coughs> so with Voltron style stuff, you either go with auras, which is usually white's big thing, <coughs> or you go with <coughs> equipment, which is usually where red takes it. I went with these because they stay on the battlefield if the creature dies, and with how small some of these creatures are, they may. So I wanted to make sure that the buff stuff could stay on the board. So we start off with the free to cast a quarter shield, so it gives a creature plus zero plus three in vigilance, and the reason why I actually added this is for the vigilance. Giving it to your commander and giving him a bigger ass means he survives more and can block and attack. Uh, Bone Splitter, very generic, just a one to cast, a one to equip, and it's a buff of plus two plus zero. Uh, Explorer Scope, I started putting in a lot of the budget decks just because it helps go get land. It's very important in the commander. Golem Skin Gauntlets, this one's a cool one. So it's one to cast, so very cheap. Two to equip, so it's still cheap. Uh, the creature gets, the equipped creature gets plus one plus zero for each equipment attached to it, and there are a bunch of these in here, so it's going to get a little beefy. Infiltrator, infiltration Lens helps make it unblockable. Uh, I'm sorry, that's later. Uh, this makes it so that when it becomes blocked, you can draw two cards. One of the weaknesses in white is card draw. That's what this solves. Silver Inlaid Dagger, so it's a buff of plus two plus zero, and then if the creature's a human, which there are a lot of humans in here, it gets an additional plus one plus zero for the same base cost and equip cost as the Bone Splitter, or whatever the hell this thing's called. Yeah, the Bone Splitter. It's just, it's an upgraded version. Uh, Dark Steel Axe, same thing again, it's a one to cast, two to equip, buff of plus two plus zero, but it's also indestructible, so it won't, it'll be really hard to remove, and people won't really remove it. Uh, Amorphous Axe, it's a, a buff of plus three plus zero for, and is every creature type, and that helps with things that get a buff in, that are in here, if they're a human. Uh, Ring of Thun. Sounds like a uh, Elder Scrolls thing. Uh, two to cast, uh, uh, equip cost of one. The equip creature has vigilance. I tried to get as much vigilance in here as possible because you want to be able to attack and still defend against other attackers. Uh, and then at the beginning of your upkeep, you can put a plus one plus one counter on equipped creature. If it's white, almost everything, if not everything in here is white. So every upkeep, if it's equipped to something, we'll put a plus one plus one counter on it. Please remember that if you remove this, it does not take the counters with it. They stay on the creature. Prowler's Hump. This is the one I was thinking when I said it was unblockable. So, uh, this is 2 to cast and 2 to equip, and the equipped creature cannot be blocked except by walls. And unless you're, like, playing somebody who's playing Dorn, you're not really running into a lot of walls. Pen and Blade. So, equipped creature, equipped creature gets plus 1, plus 1 for each creature you control, and there are a lot of creatures here. Locks in Warhammer. Gives the creature plus 3, plus 0. Trample and lifelink. And lifelink is important because you kind of want to keep your life, life total high. Ah, the Sigiled Sword of Valoran. The 3 to cast, 3 to equip. Uh, the creature gets plus two plus zero and vigilance and is also a knight in addition to its other types. And then whenever a quick creature attacks, you also create a two two white knight token with vigilance that's also attacking. Always good to have additional bodies on the field. Plate armor, so three to cast, three to equip, and the creature gets plus three plus three and has ward one. If you don't understand the wording of ward on the reminder text, let me know. I'll explain it to you. And the last equipment is Mace of Valiant. Uh, it's a 3 to cast, 3 to equip, the creature gets plus 1, plus 1 for each charge counter on the mace, and also has vigilance. So remember, that is key in this deck, is giving these guys vigilance, because you want to be able to defend attacks. And then whenever a creature enters the battlefield under control, you put a charge counter on the mace. There are a lot of creatures, there are some token makers in here, so it says whenever a creature doesn't say non-token creature, so even when that happens, in mid-combat, because of, which one was it? This one here, when the creature comes into play, this can get a counter in the middle of combat, giving a buff to whatever it's equipped. So, good stuff right there. Finally, we're going to go into, like, the last section, which is kind of the fence and... You know, utility. Uh, trapped in a tower. You can read that. It's basically just a prison effect. It's mostly prison effects. Uh, reprobation, another prison effect. Uh, a little different lit done, but it's still a prison effect. It, it turns the thing into a base zero, base power on top of zero, one, and a coward. So, arrest, can't attack or block. 
Bound in gold, same thing. Can't attack, block, but he also can't crew vehicles. And can't be activated unless... Uh, I'm sorry. And it's activated abilities can't be activated. Uh, Desert's Hold, another version of a prison effect. I'm just going to rifle through these. And here is Binding. Suppression Bonds. Face Fetters. All of them are prison effects. Isolation Zone. Exile Effect. Uh, the defense part is stuff that helps get rid of other things on your opponent's board. So this one destroys an artifact or an enchantment. With Converter, it may cost four or less. Uh, revoke ex existence, exiles an enchantment or artifact. Divine Offering does uh, destroys an artifact and gives you life. Seal of Cleansing destroys an artifact or enchantment, but it's the enchantment form of disenchant. Oh, and disenchant. And lastly, the final card in the deck is a just plain board wipe, Nevenerals Disc. Comes into play tapped, pay one, tap it to destroy artifacts. If you have a way to make things indestructible, you can do this turn over and over and over again. And everything dies on everybody's side except for yours, minus the lands. So that's the deck in a nutshell. It's a pretty fun deck. It's pretty simple. This is more for the beginner or person just trying to figure out how to build a deck. It's nothing special, but it is fun. So keep that in mind. It is for sale. Uh, as promised, I'm going to do a small, real quick upgrade section for you. So you can take a, a look at what you can do to this deck to make it actually shine. And then we're going to get out of here. I'm going to tell you a couple things real quick and then we'll go. Uh, so with Gwende, lands. I always start with lands. Some lands that you can add to make this really shine. Uh, Amiria of the Sky Ruin, always, always good. Uh, in any white deck, if you've got one, just use it. Especially if it's mono white or two color white. Mist Veil, Pla Mist Veil Plains is a good one. Uh, Sarah Sanctum, while very expensive, uh, you would use that if you change this deck over to an Aura's deck, obviously, but it's a good option to put in there if you do do that. Uh, Nykthos Shrine of the Nyx, because everything's one color, so obviously it's a good ramp card. Uh, War Room helps you draw cards along with Bonders Enclave. Both of them will help you uh, with a one with a, a monocolor deck, especially War Room, because it only does one damage to you and you have ways to gain life in this deck, so it doesn't hurt you at all. Uh, Caracas is a good one. Helps return commanders, uh, opposing commanders to their understand if you uh, so choose. Uh, Forge of Heroes is a good one. It actually was just reprinted in one of the last commander decks. I highly suggest getting it and putting it in the deck like this. And then the Hall of Healage Generosity helps you get uh, enchantments back from your grave. Again, if you switch over to a R's theme instead of a equipment theme, there are a lot of enchantments in here that are prison effects. You can still use it, though. Uh, as far as uh, lands, that's pretty good, and that's what I'm going to stop at. Let me do some ramp stuff for you. On the ramp section, we're in white, and again, I mentioned right at the beginning of the video that green and white are the two best colors for it, green obviously being one, white being a distant second. So we're going to start with, like, Tithe, or Gift of Estates, and for once, I'm actually going to very confidently suggest Land Tax, because it's a single color deck, so you're literally going to have nothing but basic, really. Uh, and I mentioned also in the ramp section that there are some expensive white cards that you can use to help ramp you, so that's, like, Archaeomancer's Map, uh, Smothering Tithe, which is just insanely expensive now. Uh, you've got things like Thought Vessel, which are mana rocks that are two to cast and help you with other things. There's Liquid Metal Torque that you can use as well. If you want to get really expensive, you've got the Mox Diamond, because you're in a single color deck, it doesn't hurt you to discard land. Uh, Mox Opal, because you're literally doing nothing but an artifact buffing, so Mox Opal will be turn turned on pretty quickly. Uh, and Jewel Lotus, which is the newer addition for Commander Legends, which really is an auto-include in any deck, especially monocolor. Uh, some of the dudes that you can do, um, so we have a couple of different ways you can go about this. So some first strikers I did include that are, you know, monetarily expensive, uh, but also help do other things. So you got, like, Knight of the White Orchid helps you go and uh, get lands if you want. Uh, Archetype of Courage for an Uncommon is actually quite expensive, or at least it was, I don't know if it is still. But it helps, uh, it gives all of your creatures first strike and takes first strike away from all your opponent's creatures. Card draw stuff, you've got, like, Esper Sentinel, something from Modern Horizons 2 that's just really good. Uh, some other ramp stuff, you got Keeper of the Accord, or Boreas Charger. I don't know how to say it, Boreas, Boris, I don't know. Uh, Anthem Effects, if you want to do some Anthem Effects, especially uh, this one, Elish Norn. It's an Anthem Effect that buffs your creatures, and it's an, an anti-Anthem Effect that l can kill your opponent's creatures. Or Banalish Marshal is a nice little buff creature for your, uh, it's generic plus one, plus one for all your creatures. Uh, some utility stuff, like a Sun Titan to help get your low casting cost creatures back. Mirror Entity, uh, it's an interesting one because there are combos with Mirror Entity that you can go infinite with. I won't go into them right now, uh, I did it on a previous video. But it's one of those weird ones where like you can make all your creatures, if you have the mana, 10 tens. And then they're double striking, so you're literally hitting for like a freight train. Uh, and last but not least, and probably the most important one, especially if you're doing uh, Voltron with equipment, is Stoneforge Mystic. <laughs> it's like 40 or 50 bucks, but it definitely is an important part to this. There are a couple creatures like Stoneforge Mystic, Stoneforge Mystic, but not quite as cheap to cast. And I think their ability is more limited. So, <laughs> all good options there. For spells, obviously we're going to go into removal. White is the king of removal. I know black has a lot of murder style effects, but... White is literally the best color for destruction. As fun as that sounds, because it's the holy color. It's kind of a nod to the fact that, you know, religion's more about destruction than actual building. Uh, that's just my opinion. Please don't take it to heart. Uh, so stone, uh, yeah, STP. So swords to plowshares, all targeted removal. And there's a bunch of targeted removal. Some of it's really expensive as far as the mana cost. There are things like swords to plowshares, and there are three others that are like one to cast instance that you can remove targeted. Uh, you've got Wrath of God effects, so white has a lot of things that are... Strong creatures, sometimes they can't be regenerated, sometimes they can. Regeneration is not that big of a deal anymore because it's not really printed on cards anymore. Uh, 
There's also other mass destruction spells that let you choose artifacts, enchantments, creatures, and then you can destroy all of one type. Lots of them. Look in the uh, gatherer or use MTG Familiar and see what you need as far as that goes for your meta. Uh, tutors, we have Enlightened Tutor, obviously. If you're going either auras or artifacts for equipment as your Voltron, you know, equipping your Quende, either way, Enlightened Tutor gets either one. Open the Armory, however, is another option you can do, but that only goes and gets equipment, I believe. I'll have it up there so you can see. Uh, Flawless Maneuver, it's that the one from, I believe it was Commander 2020, where it was free if you have a Commander out. And I think it makes all of your creatures indestructible, always good. Uh, and then, obviously, we're in white, so Teferi's Protection is always a must. Uh, lately, they've been making, they, they, for the last couple of years, they've made white was weak because it doesn't have card draw, but they gave it some ink, little inklings of cards that are literally just auto-includes in any white deck because it's how you, white actually gets card draw and protects itself. They're almost auto-includes. That includes the Archimancer's Map and the Smothering Tides. So if you're playing white, unfortunately, you have to play like a Teferi's Protection. <laughs> Alright, enchantment-wise, I mentioned that you can go the other way instead of doing artifact uh, Voltron-style stuff. You can do ours, so things like all that glitters. And there are a bunch of them, and I mean a lot of different orders you can use instead. you got to use the Gather or MTG Familiar if you have an Android, and trust me, there are a lot. You can look up what you either have already, or you can look up the better ones. Uh, there's one, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, it was too white. You can only enchant an enchanted creature, and it gives it like plus four, plus four, double strike, and all this other vigilance and whatever. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, I want to get my hands on like four of them, uh, but it's it's out there. Uh, you got Divine Sacrament, it's a good addition for this deck specifically. You've got other prison-style enchantments, like Oblivion Ring, I didn't have any extra to put in here. Uh, of the new classes, Paladin class will fit here too. It's a good one, and I'm going to have that up there so you can read that. Felidar's Retreat, so whenever you play land, you can actually just keep putting more tokens into play if you want to go do a go wide strategy. And then Sigarda's Aid lets you equip or cast ours at instant speed. It's actually quite monetarily expensive for what, it, you know, it, it's not used heavily, but man, it's definitely expensive. But it's a good option. Uh, as far as artifacts go, so the meat and potatoes of this deck is usually the equip equipment so that you can make your commander bigger and hit harder. Uh, you've got the swords, specifically... All the swords can work if they're not pro-white, all right? Light and Shadow is the one that I've written down here because that's the one that looks like it may be the best option, though. Uh, you've got Sword of the Animus, so you can go get lands with it. Endless Atlas allows you to draw cards if you have three or more of the same land in play and you have nothing but little planes in here, so it's good. If you want to do more buff stuff, uh, more Anthem-style stuff, the Immortal Sun is a great option. It helps. It prevents your opponent from being able to use Planeswalker abilities. You too, but, you know, this deck isn't meant for that. Uh, and it busts all your creatures, gives you an extra draw turn. It's always good. Uh, you can do cost reduction stuff. So, Pearl Medallion... Don't really mention Pearl Medallion very often, but that's a great one from Tempest, and then obviously reprinted in one of the Commander sets. Uh, Acroma's Memorial, not really an Anthem so much as it's an ability giver. It gives a lot of different abilities to your creatures. Always good. And then uh, Oketra's Monument. So this one's a cost reducer for your creatures and also helps you go wide. So whenever you cast a creature, you get a 1-1 one, one white white creature. Good for go wide strategy if, that, if you have to change your plan in the middle of the game. Uh, I did say that we're not really looking at Planeswalkers for this deck, but if you did want to use some Planeswalkers, there are a couple. Uh, a Johnny Steadfast is a good one to add. And then I have a pair of two Planeswalkers that I like to put together just because it makes a... It doesn't... It's not a lock, but it helps in creature-based decks to kind of make it really hard for removing your creatures. So Teo, the Shield Mage, and the Wanderer. So one prevents, like, non-combat damage, and the other one makes it so that you have Hexproof and so does all your creatures. <coughs> I believe it's all your creatures. Uh, you all, I'll have it up there. You can take a look at it. But I like the combination of those two together. It makes it difficult to remove you and your creatures from the game. All right? And finally, the last action I'm going to go over is the one combo that I would put into this deck. White doesn't have a lot, but it does have one really hard one to get rid of unless they're playing enchantment removal. So if you're going against Black, good luck to them. Uh, Solemnity, Phyrexian Unlife. So Solemnity says that you don't get put counters on things. Phyrexian Unlife says that if your life would go to zero, instead of dying, you now get poison counters for the amount of damage that you're being dealt. The good thing is that Solemnity says you can't get counters, so no matter how much damage you take, you can be at zero life, and you don't die. So, that's the combo I've got for this deck. It's not a bad one. Uh, there are better ones, obviously, but that's pretty fun, especially if you're doing nothing but combat damage, and you, you know, it's it's fast, but in Commander at 40 life for everybody, and there's three people usually, it's not as fast as it would be, say, in a 60-card format, White Weenie style, all right? <laughs> so that's the deck. That's Quinday Pride Ephemera, if that's what I... Uh, let's go over a couple things after that. So... I have actually got something that I'm going to put together for next week. Rather than do a deck video, I've got a little surprise for everybody. I was able to pick up one of these stupid mystery boxes, and I'm going to be doing something on that next week so that we can uh, finally put the rest whether or not people who are telling you that it's a scam have a vested interest because they're selling product too, and they don't want you buying somebody else's product. <laughs> Professor. Um, and then after that, for the next two weeks after that, I've got a couple more commander decks for you. Uh, they're going to be variations of white. I believe it's a white, black, and a white... What is it? It's a white, black, and a white green, I think. I don't know, but that'll be coming in the next couple weeks, so it'll be fun decks. Uh, I started to get to the white section. Uh, I had the convention last weekend. My, I, like, that's why my voice is a little hard, hoarse. Uh, I didn't get to these before the con, uh, and since they didn't sell at the con, like the 
Shatter Gang Brothers did, I can do the video on them and then we'll be selling them on Facebook Marketplace and on my website uh, on Facebook. It's my business page. So speaking of that, yes, this deck is for sale. All my commander decks are $40. Now, I don't beg for help. Um, I'm actually not able to buy much product right now. Um, we've been hit pretty hard with the way that the cost of everything's rising and I'm not a beggar of money. Uh, what I do do, though, is I do make these things to sell so that you get to actually play something different than what Wizards puts out there and something that's a little different so nobody knows what you're actually playing. And the way that you can support me is to buy one of these decks. I have 30 of them sitting out there. Uh, it's at the con. I think I sold five, and I think I got 25 left or something like that. So that's an option for you to help support somebody like me. It's really helpful when you do because I put that money right back into getting more product to make more decks, to, you know, and the cycle continues. I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, can you hand me five bucks for doing what I do? It's just not my style. I actually like to give something on top of the videos for my... Uh, for my peddling, I guess you could say, for my begging. Uh, other ways that you can support the channel, please do me the favor, like the video. The more likes it gets, the more like out there it gets on the YouTube's analytics. That means that other people can see it. Uh, subscribing to the channel, if you have not done so yet, helps because I, if I get to 1,000 and I get to 4,000 hours of you know watch time, which would also help if you guys could just watch all the other videos, uh, then they pay me instead of having me having to beg. I know that some channels out there, I'm not going to name any names, already have the way that they get paid through YouTube, and then they also beg for money. I don't understand that. Uh, somebody's already paying you. How are you going to beg for money? Uh, but yeah, subscribe, watch some, some more videos. Uh, share this out. If you share this out, it gets more uh, viewing. People will watch it, you know, and then you've done your part. And that would help me, you know, find people who want to buy this deck, which helps support the channel, or... Maybe somebody who wants to build a deck. I don't have to sell the deck if they've already got the cards. They can put the deck together themselves. Then they can watch other videos that maybe I've got something that they also like that they want to watch. And again, that is a cyclical thing. So the more people who get this when you share it out, the more likely I'm going to get to that mark that I need so that I can actually get more product in and actually do more builds. So that's just how you can support this channel. Other than that, I'm not going to bend your ear anymore. If you need my contact information, if you want to contact me for any reason, it's uh, the Facebook page. It's Blue Bears Games. Uh, you should see the symbol here. I'm going to have it up there for you. You'll definitely see it. Uh, email me if you want to talk to me. It's blueberrysgames at gmail.com. Or if for some reason you don't want to do that and you want to give me your contact information and I contact you, just put it down there in the uh, comment section. That's it for the week. I'll be back next week with a mystery power box opening and see how finally get down to the nitty gritty. Have a good one. See you next week. Do it. Do it. Oh, come on. Do it now.